Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all and particularly to His Royal Highness the Duke of York. So we're delighted to have you here. And also our distinguished speakers this evening, Sir Professor John Salston, uh, Professor John Harris and Professor Richard Dawkins. This is another in a remarkable set of lectures for the 21st Century School. The purpose of the 21st Century School is to bring great minds together to focus on the biggest challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. And we've been extremely fortunate in our past lectures to have uh, Lord Nick Stern, Craig Venter, and most recently Joe Stiglitz last week focusing on their particular areas. But the area of what science is for and how we may make a difference is one that is particularly important in broadly for this university uh, and for people in general, as anyone that opens the daily papers will have no doubt. We have at the university a very distinguished professor in Richard Dawkins, the Simoni Professor of Science, who's devoted his life and his work not only to huge advances in zoology and biological sciences, but in making science understandable. Indeed, I believe there's no other person living or in the past that has done a bigger job in making science understandable to a broad community. And in this, he has inspired generations of thinkers, he has inspired scientists to think again about their assumptions. The area that we are dealing with of what science is for requires rational, secular thought. And so it is really a delight to have someone who is not only, I think, the most amongst some rational of scientists, but is also someone who has been amongst the most artistic in his ability to express science and make ideas come alive to us all. And it is a great delight that I invite Professor Dawkins to the podium to introduce this evening's talk. He will join us again for the conversation afterwards and at the end we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, what is science for is our title for this evening. Of course, the first thing it's for is to find out what's true about the real world, the universe, the planet, life. The application of science is another matter, and we can express that in less high-flown language, in the territory where science overlaps with technology. Lewis Walpert perhaps goes too far when he portrays science and technology as almost opposite. But it is fair to draw a distinction between pure and applied science. There are those who feel that science should earn its keep by contributing to the welfare of humankind. Such people would, for example, justify preserving the Amazon forests on the grounds that new and unknown medicines might lurk in the bark of as yet undiscovered trees. Uh, there are those, I mean, those same people uh, might, when asked to justify space exploration, appeal to the non stick frying pan as something, as a bit of spin off from the NASA uh, space program. Personally, I think that's rather like justifying music on the grounds that it's good exercise for the violinist's right arm. Those same people would refuse to vote money, say, to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva because discovering the Higgs boson or with luck opening new floodgates of theoretical physics doesn't contribute to feeding the starving or curing AIDS or malaria. I visited CERN twice, and both times I was moved close to tears by this magnificent feat of international cooperation, surely one of the crowning glories of the human species. And I feel the same way about the Hubble telescope, about the various unmanned spacecraft that are exploring the solar system, and of course about the Human Genome Project and the whole enterprise of molecular biology since 1953, uh, and one of the modern heroes of that revolution is, of course, Sir John Salston, who's here this evening. What the molecular biology revolution over the past half century has achieved is nothing less than the inclusion of fundamental biology 
as a branch of information technology. This has entailed the slaying of the ancient dragon of vitalism, a victory which in turn redoubles science's confidence in the eventual slaying of dualism too. To give an idea of how much has changed since the molecular biology revolution, I want to read the last paragraph, the valedictory paragraph, from a work of 20th century philosophy of science, uh, which was written crucially before 1953. The author is Charles Singer. Despite interpretations to the contrary, the theory of the gene is not a mechanist theory. The gene is no more comprehensible as a chemical or physical entity than is the cell, or for that matter, the organism itself. If I ask for a living chromosome, that is for the only effective kind of chromosome, no one can give it to me except in its living surroundings, any more than he can give me a living arm or leg. The doctrine of the relativity of functions is as true for the gene as it is for any of the organs of the body. They exist and function only in relation to other organs. Thus, the last of the biological theories leaves us where the first started, in the presence of a power called life, or psyche, which is not only of its own kind, but unique in each and all of its exhibitions. Now, that's not just wrong in some factual particular, such as we expect in something out of date and readily pardon. It's much more wrong than that. It is deeply wrong, dyed in the wool wrong, interestingly wrong, wrong in the very fiber of its being. Because nowadays, thanks to people like John Sulston, the entire genome of an organism can be written on paper, on punched paper tape, on a magnetic tape, on a magnetic disk, and can be stored away for a thousand years, and then brought out again off the shelf in a thousand years' time. And the original animal, or at least a copy of it, an identical twin of it, can be recreated. That's an astounding revolution. The molecular biology, then, is not, is, sorry, is another of those great worldwide internationally cooperative enterprises that make one proud to be human. And John Sulston is one of its two or three top leaders today. He was educated at Cambridge after a spell at the Salk Institute in California, which is another major center of advanced biological research. He returned to Cambridge to work with the great Sidney Brenner at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, where so many of the great advances in the subject have been made, including those of Fred Sanger, who gave his name to the Sanger Center in Cambridge. Uh, as director of the Sanger Center, John Sulston led the British end of the International Human Genome Project, and he shared the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine with Sidney Brenner for his work on the genome of the roundworm Xenorhabditis elegans, this little known soil-dwelling animal known to molecular biologists as the nematode or even as the worm, much to the amusement of zoologists, um, has achieved a status that rivals Drosophila or the laboratory mouse as what one might call the guinea pig of molecular biology. John Salston is a molecular biologist of enormous distinction, and we're very fortunate to have him here today in Oxford. Molecular biology couldn't, by any stretch of the imagination, be accused of being purely academic, like, say, the deep field imaging of distant galaxies. Molecular biology is also up to its neck in usefulness and in ethical and moral dilemmas, potential dangers, dangers that some would see as moral, and this is where John Harris comes in, why a collaboration between John Harris and John Salston is so pertinent. There is a danger, especially in the biomedical field, that some people will mistake a question of morality for a question of morality, what is in fact um, no more than their own personal prejudice or even disgust, what's been called the yuck factor. Moral philosophy is the correct profession to deal with such matters. And among moral philosophers, John Harris has been outstanding in his insistence on maintaining strict standards of rational thought, resolutely banishing yuck thinking, prejudices that are based on nothing more worthwhile than tradition, scripture, authority, or even revelation. 
John Harris is one of the country's leading medical ethicists. He's the Lord David Alliance Professor of Bioethics in the University of Manchester. He did his DPhil here at Oxford and in the course of a distinguished career has published a large number of books and papers on various aspects of medical bioethics. He's lately become the research director of Manchester's Institute of Science, Ethics and Innovation. And John Salston is the chairman of that institute whose purpose is to examine the ethical questions raised by science and technology in the 21st century, which is obviously the area of interest of the newly formed James Martin 21st century school, whose director is Ian Goldin, who gave me such a, an exaggeratedly kindly introduction just now. Uh, so the research director and the chairman of this forward-looking institute are joining forces for us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome them both and invite them to do their double act on the subject of what is science for. Your Royal Highness, people, the relevance of uh, the second part of that will, uh, will come in a moment. Um, I thought our question this evening is, what is science for? And I know you're all aching to know the answer to that question. So I thought, so that we can all relax, we'll just give you the answer and then we can all go home. Um, and it's a two-part answer because John and I have different answers to this question. Uh, I tend to take the view the utilitarian view criticized a moment ago by Richard Dawkins, that if science is to be respectable, then it has to do good. So my answer to the question, what is science for, is to do good. John has complementary but different Whereas ideas. There's nothing wrong with doing good, but the most important thing science does is to explore. And we shall continue to look at these during the talk. In the future, there will be no more humans. This is not one of the things we should worry about. I just thought you'd like to think about that proposition while we carry on. We'll return to it in a moment. Recent discussions of innovation in science and technology have been characterized by a general tendency to regard them as causes for concern rather than opportunities for good. Of course, some are causes for concern, and most are opportunities for good. People, even scientists, don't tend to develop things that they think will be a disaster. But of course, they can be wrong. We need, therefore, to decide more rationally and more readily what should be worried about and what we should welcome. Of course, we must always be vigilant. Vigilance is not only the price of liberty, but the price of safety. However, a precautionary approach is self-defeating when it prevents or delays innovation which will save or improve lives. We need to remember that we need more and better science and innovation so that the ethical imperative of making the world a better place can be realized. Today we're going to talk about some of the things we need to worry about more and some we can regard with some equanimity. But before we do that, we need to think for a moment about the motivation, what drives science. It can be driven either by needs or by curiosity, but more often by a combination of both. Remember too, its effective practice requires a substantial degree of openness through both informal and formal communication, uh, for example, peer-reviewed publication, which provides some assurance of accuracy and allows the attribution of credit for achievement. But irrespective of motivation, of course, scientific research frequently gives rise to goods and services that are novel and valuable, to good things, in fact. Now, as Richard just reminded us, traditionally, science was divided into pure and applied. And uh, nowadays, people have become a little leery about this. They prefer to talk about research and development. 
Uh, the, the, in either case, the idea is that the one is financed from the public or charitable purse and so is able to explore freely, and the, the latter is financed by investment and so is naturally goal-oriented. But this distinction has become very unfashionable for various reasons, some of them not very good, which we won't talk about now, but one good reason is the undoubted fact that research and development coexist, even in the same person, and are dependent upon one another. So without novel findings from research, there can be no development, and of course in the course of development, novel ideas can turn up which don't belong to the goal-oriented process. And the pace of research is often conditionable on, on, on technological progress, in instrumentation, for example, and so on. The two are all mixed up, and all of this mandates abandonment of an unnecessary semantic distinction. Fair enough. But this pragmatism becomes destructive if it further mandates, for either financial or social reasons, that all research should have a defined purpose. The most important and far-reaching discoveries come about through unfettered exploration. You can see where my bias is, you see. The exercise of curiosity, in fact. Furthermore, the most important discoveries should be open so that their implications can be scrutinized by all and their effects made benign. People are actually quite right to be suspicious of science going on behind closed doors. Now we shall turn, we should return to other facets of all this uh, later on in the talk, but here we want to note that short-term utility is an unreliable guide to discovery. Curiosity is what really counts. In Shakespeare's The Tempest, Miranda, brought up in the company of her father Prospero, a magician, and assorted magical beings, sees ordinary men for the first time and likes what she sees. Oh wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here. How beauteous mankind is. Oh brave new world that has such people in it. Since Huxley, brave new worlds have had a bad press. But Miranda is a better guide to the ethics of innovation than Aldous. Miranda can be seen as celebrating the discovery of her own kind, a celebration of humanity, but we think she sees a deeper truth. The only men she has encountered hitherto besides her father are the magical intangible Ariel and the loathsome pitiable Caliban, not much of a choice for a spirited young woman. When she encounters young, good-looking Italian men, she is not so much confirming a species preference, but demonstrating openness to a better world than the one she currently inhabits, a brave new world. Miranda's quotidian world is magical, and she chooses a better, less familiar world. The prestige and power of science has sometimes been attributed to the fact that science is just magic that works. Insofar as it is, the future, as well as the past, is truly magical. And it will have all sorts of unprecedented and, if we make them that way, goodly creatures in it. In the future, there will be all kinds of new creatures out there. And it will be our business, our, when I say our, we, I always mean all of us. In a democracy, we is everyone. It will be our business to ensure that they are as goodly as they can be. Some will result from something more akin to construction than sexual reproduction. They may be the product of so-called synthetic gametes or synthetic biology. But however synthetic their creation, they will be real in every important sense. It is an irony that we, human beings, agonize about the loss of any randomly created species, but are scared witless of producing new kinds of beings. We think it is just as well 
that new sorts of beings are on the way. Because as I've indicated in the future, it is likely that we will have to face the end of humanity as we know it. We will either have died out altogether, killed off by self-created global warming or disease, or we may hope we will either have been replaced by our successors produced by continuing Darwinian evolution or increasingly more likely by successors we have deliberately produced ourselves by what I've called elsewhere enhancement evolution. The end of humanity then is not itself a cause for concern. Making sure that what replaces us with something better is a huge concern. One of the most dramatic and important of the new technologies that will produce new creatures is synthetic biology. When people talk about synthetic biology and synthetic life, they may have in mind Frankenstein scientists like John in the lab making creatures out of old socks and coat hangers, or perhaps some bubbling vat of bio biochemical primeval soup out of which will arise either a monster or a perfect specimen of humanity. This, however, is far from likely, or at least very far in the future. Synthetic biology is the name now used for a cluster of new technologies in which biomolecular components, natural or synthetic, are newly combined or reorganized in order to create novel genetic and biochemical circuitry, pathways, and ultimately, organisms. It may, be the thought, it may be thought of as a hybrid discipline between science and engineering. Now, synthetic biology has caught the imagination, not least because it marks the beginnings of what looks like the possibility of manufacturing life forms from scratch, and eventually, of creating tailor-made creatures in our own image, or in principle in the image and with the attributes of anything we like, or at least of anything that we can engineer. This is heavy stuff, and if it works, it may give rise to unprecedented powers, which like all powers may be used for good or evil, or simply wasted for lack of use or because we put too much faith in the precautionary principle. Many people believe that we humans have been made in the image of God, by a God who presumably likes the way she looks. Is it the hubris of such a prospect, however remote, that makes the possibility of humans doing the same so daunting and dramatic? Hubris may be an unpleasant personal trait, a defect of character, However, it is not hubris to believe that we can do better than evolution has so far succeeded in doing and to try to do better. So a continuing question will be, is synthetic biology one of the things we should be worried about and how should we begin to address such a question? A deep precursor question and one that needs much more informed public discussion, is the question of what role humanity, species membership, in short, the descriptive sense of being human, plays in our evaluative use of that term, or what role it should play. There is not only a danger, I believe, there is a long-established and deeply ingrained habit of identifying properties or qualities that are contingently possessed by human beings as necessarily possessed by our kind and moreover, necessarily not possessed by other kinds. Kinds of individuals other than humans of whatsoever nature who possess the characteristics that enable them not only to have a life but to be aware that they have a life have at least since the 17th century been termed persons to distinguish them simply from members of a particular species. So long as persons continue to exist, we shouldn't worry too much about whether or not 
they're human. Suppose our common ape ancestor, believed to have lived somewhere between five and seven million years ago in Africa, suppose our common ape ancestor and his or her, her friends and relations had had the wit and the foresight to get together and had proposed a universal declaration of simian rights on the model, perhaps, of UNESCO's wonderful universal declaration on the human genome and human rights. Suppose that they, like UNESCO, had thought that it was a jolly good idea to keep things exactly as they are and to protect simian nature, to preserve it, quote, as the common heritage of simian kind. If that had happened, we wouldn't be enjoying this pleasant afternoon in Oxford today. When we ask questions like, what is it to be human? or talk about a person's humanity, or talk of the human spirit, or human values, or indeed of human rights, we not only emphasize the properties that typically distinguish our species from species not capable of having values, we indulge in a sort of chauvinism, celebrating our own kind, as we do in a different sense when we talk about, if we do, Britishness, European culture, or Western civilization. You'll remember that Gandhi famously, when asked what he, on his first visit to London, what he thought of Western civilization, responded, I think it would be a very good thing. <laughs> this human chauvinism is often given a pseudo-scientific bent. We talk about species barriers as if, insofar as such things exist, they are laws of nature, set up simply to protect our supposed species purity. What matters then is not being human, but the existence of beings, perhaps like us, that have those powers and capacities that make it worthwhile to be human or worthwhile to be anything else. Whether new creatures are created by synthetic biology or by mixing the elements of different species, or indeed through multiple forms of technology, we may indeed, in all probability, we must and we will eventually create new types of creature that might join us and, we may hope, will eventually replace us. Whether or not the non-human persons arise through technology or in the course of further evolution, in the far future, as I've noted, there will be no more humans. And I believe that we don't need to worry about this so long as we can replace ourselves with something better. The desire to better ourselves and make ourselves better is part of the curiosity and the need that, as John has mentioned, drives science. One of the oldest and most valuable of the things that characterize persons is just that drive and that need. The example of a synthetic, and I hope it will be an enhancing technology that we've highlighted today, synthetic biology, causes great concern. Whether it should or not perhaps is illuminated, quite literally, by thinking of another synthetic technology with which we are more familiar. I'm thinking, of course, of synthetic sunshine. Enhancement technologies, including chemical, genetic, and other high-tech examples, have given and can continue to give those of us who use them an edge, and have often been criticized for the injustice that this supposedly creates. Before fires, candles, lamps, and other forms of synthetic sunshine were available, most people went to sleep when it got dark. Candles, synthetic sunshine, enabled social life and work to continue into the evening and through the night and conferred all sorts of advantages on those able and willing to take advantage of them, to be sure sometimes at the expense of those who did not or could not 
similarly take advantage. Contemporary and future enhancements may create, will create, problems of injustice, both in that they provide a means for some to gain an advantage, those who read by candlelight gain in a way that others do not, and because they may create unfair pressures as a result of the capabilities conferred by the enhancing technology, like the pressure to stay up late and to read all work because one can and because one knows that if I don't, others will, and they will thereby gain an advantage. The solution, though, surely, is establishing fair working hours and perhaps the provision at public expense, if necessary, of sources of light, not banning the candles. The solution is a combination of regulation and distributive justice, not a Luddite rejection of technology. Just think for a moment of a different, but no less, in fact, far more serious example in that it is contemporary. We in the United Kingdom are trying not very seriously, in my view, to make kidney transplants available to all who need them, as it is believed has been achieved by the Belgians, the Spanish, the Austrians, and other European nations. Even when that is achieved, we know that thousands in the rest of the world cannot obtain the transplants they need. But we do not, and surely we should not say, that we will perform no more transplants until they can be provided for all. The strategy of choice is surely to try to take the measures that we know can make donor organs more generally available. But fairness, justice, global or national, does not require that we close down a technology until its benefits can be universally provided. So when enhancements make life or lives better, they are justified if they do just that. If they also confer what's called positional advantage, that is no part of the justification. And this fact will always create reasons to distribute such advantages as widely and as fairly as possible. The most urgent and worrying ethical problems surrounding the use of any new technology, including synthetic biology, are not the dangers of pursuing such research and the innovation that may result. Such dangers attend all research and innovation of whatsoever kind and must always be resolved, if they're resolvable, by the best estimation of risk as against benefit. The dangers, I believe, that have been consistently underestimated are the dangers of not pursuing research because a host of feeble and often incoherent objections and objectors have placed themselves in the path of progress towards a better future for humanity and indeed a different set of persons. The problem is turning our back on these possibilities, perhaps because in T.S. Eliot's famous world, words, we do not dare disturb the universe. Well, talking of disturbing the universe, over to John. So we must look more closely at this issue of fairness, the issues of distribution of goods. As John's argued absolutely rightly, progress must not be blocked for precautionary or any other reasons. But at the same time, both ethical and practical considerations enjoin a regard for equitable treatment of everyone. There's a dilemma here that we must consider. But first, though, who is this one, who is this everyone, who should be equitably treated? We've just seen that in the future, we shall have to define and redefine personhood in the light of various sorts of enhancement and creation. But this is not just for the future, it's here with us now. Globalization has led to great and increasing inequality. People, on the one hand, are mutually dependent on one another as never before, but mutual respect is really little better than it was a century ago. Admittedly, we've moved on from Victorian times and the scientific idea, so-called scientific idea of a hierarchy of races. But uh, indeed, for some, it was not even clear that all humans were the same species. 
But despite the modernist realization that we are one species with equal rights in principle, explicit oppression of one group by another is not only tolerated, but even extolled by some of our leaders as the right thing to do. And globalization has not changed the economic imbalances characteristic of imperialism, in which trading rules are set by the rich for the benefit of the rich. Well, but come back to this in a moment, but note that personhood is still far from enjoying a universal status. And even within communities that are relatively homogeneous in terms of wealth, there are practical difficulties over regulation of medical procedures because of differing ethical standpoints. So, for example, among Christians, Catholic and evangelists alike feels threatened by developments that define the human embryo as not being a full person. And such differences will obviously lead to practical difficulties in, for example, stem cell regulation. So if UK scientists indeed do develop effective means to use embryonic stem cells, uh, what will uh, a country in Eastern Europe uh, do with the products if they do not wish to, to, uh, to undertake this research. Such a possibility then raises questions of the legitimacy and effectiveness of regulation. And to meet both these requirements, regulations have to be universal or at least universally coherent and have to be the right ones. And in the absence of such harmonization, and because of the mobility of the richest quartile, there will be a continued increase in the practice of health tourism. Does this matter? Uh, do we care that poor people are being persuaded or duped into selling a kidney to those who can afford to pay? Analogously, different regulations provide opportunities for scientists to travel to do work that would not be permitted in their own country. One might call it research tourism. It, is this a valuable freedom in an otherwise too uniform world? Is it satisfactory that clinical trials are being exported to developing countries where costs are lower and perhaps regulation less stringent? The difficulty, of course, in both cases is that without some agreement of minimal principles, there's a race to the bottom and no ethical improvement is possible. And the answer must surely be, as John has, has said, I reiterate really, is that we must strive to harmonize to a sufficient extent to globalize justice. But the judgment of when that line is reached can only be decided by progressive debate. What is clear, though, is that at present we are far from the balance point. So in my opinion, we at least know in which direction to move. We must also acknowledge that balance will never be achieved without a concomitant leveling of wealth. So that the, and the contribution of science to that levelling uh, we also need to address. Now these are matters for global agreement and also global governance. And it's been interesting talking to Ian Golden just before this talk uh, that to, to remind ourselves really that both the 21st Century School and the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation in Manchester are heavily involved in policy in this area and indeed have a, a, it will be incorporated, I think, very much into our joint program. We have a, the next meeting in Manchester in June, and we hope we'll take this up specifically and drive it on. I'm talking about it, just talking at the moment. Now, who owns science? That's a trite question, an emotive one, but an important one. In the last few decades, there's been a trend to increase the funding of science by investment and to decrease funding from public sources. This trend, of course, is welcomed by political leaders who are able to save taxpayers money and by investors who gain more control of the direction of research. Clearly a win-win situation in some respects, at least. But remember, the consequence is the funneling of science into financially profitable areas and the appearance, at the same time, of neglected areas. And with regard to human health, the trend has a number of consequences. There are all sorts of emerging dysfunctionality. Uh, globally, we have the phenomenon of neglected diseases that can't be worked on because there's no profit in them. Uh, in developed countries, we at the same time have the production of unneeded drugs. I say that, you may criticize, but it is absolutely true. 
sold by aggressive and unethical marketing practices on which actually a third of drug revenues go, a third into marketing, twice that into research and development. And finally, the very high cost of development for minority diseases. Once again, we neglect personhood in our own society. We don't have to look to the future to be worrying about this. Now, such a system as we have at the moment, underpinned firmly by the machinery of intellectual property, mitigates against fair distribution of health care of any kind, let alone enhancements. It's also bad, remember, for the conduct of science, in that patenting, far from leading to openness, as often claimed, frequently leads to secrecy uh, until the patent is filed, and then afterwards to blocks in, 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 the, in what research can be done. For key areas of science, at least, there's a strong presumption towards open access, which is both good for research and also equitable, provided there are adequate guarantees of benefit sharing. And intellectual property, in the form of patents, should really be thought of as a very useful tool with relatively narrow applicability, rather than as a means for owning ever larger swaths of human knowledge, which is the way it's being driven at the moment. The widespread misuse of intellectual property has led us to choose this as a major theme for ISEI, along with its sister institutes at Manchester, and we'll be holding actually a public meeting on the subject in July. And Joe Stieglitz and I will be talking there as part of the proceedings. Um, he was here in this magnificent setting not long ago, I know. And we hope to arouse, first of all, public interest in, in a discussion, uh, but in also to, to kick off an ongoing research program in the area. And so, really, to return to the start. We've been focusing quite a lot during the talk, and, and John has rightly emphasized the job of science to do good. But hugely significant as this humanitarian role is, and disturbingly perceived by many these days to be the sole purpose of science, we have already heard that there's actually another role which I think is arguably much more important and really underpins the doing good role. And it's related, of course, to the curiosity that we've referred to at the start of the talk, but it has hugely deep significance because science is, of course, a cultural driver in its own right. And Richard gave us some examples when we started off. Well, we can broaden this. I think we can say, quite honestly, that science, provided one defines it broadly in terms of thought, is in fact the major cultural driver, certainly over the last few hundred years, and arguably much longer. Now, this is not to attribute any magic or any new quality to science. It's simply to make the observation that our perception of the human condition and of the universe around us is constantly challenged and reshaped by the findings of science. And furthermore, without our continuous exploration by whatever methods, life would be dull indeed, even have no meaning at all. And science, for the moment at least, has proved to be a powerful method of exploration. Remember also, the scientific process is actually familiar to everybody and practiced by all, whether they name it as such or not. So I would say that broadly defined, science really is the chief purpose of humanity. Or rather, of course, of persons. Because whatever kind of persons there may be in the future, we would want them as our rightful descendants, both to be moral beings, both to do good, but also essentially to possess the innate scientific curiosity that's what, dri what drives us human persons today. And I'd like now to invite Richard to come up and join us for the last part. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both of you. I, I have the feeling that We've heard today some extremely radical suggestions which are likely to be very controversial and 
therefore, I don't propose to spend too long uh, before uh, throwing it open to the floor. Um, one or two things did strike me. The aim to produce future, a future brave new world that hath such people in it, um, and the humility to surrender our human place in the sun to these godlike future creatures that we may or may not create, persons, I couldn't help wondering how we would decide what kind of persons we would want. And it sounded from John Harris's talk as though he kind of meant persons who are capable of some kind of happiness, almost as though the aim is to increase the sum of not human happiness, but the sum of total happiness, person happiness, where persons don't have to be human and, in his view, actually won't be human. Um, but I could imagine that you could, in, in, in one sense, and more of, of an Aldous Huxley kind of sense, you could increase the total sum of happiness by um, wiring up a whole lot of persons to a brain stimulation apparatus that stimulated the areas uh, discovered by olds that simply give pure orgasmic pleasure all the time. Um, and I take it that would not be the aim, but on the other hand, it's not entirely clear why not. I mean, would, would, we, instead turn, <laughs> would we instead turn to John Salston and, su and suggest that, that, the, that the persons that we should be breeding or making or manufacturing or synthesizing would not be just after pleasure, but would be after doing pure science. Um, and then, if not pure science, um, what about music? I mean, would, would we have them capable of a sort of supernormal capacity to appreciate music, and maybe music that we can't appreciate because we're not sufficiently evolved to do so, or, or, or art? Um, or I, I just sort of feel it, it, it's, a, it's a project that needs thinking through, at very least. Um, and, um, and I'm sure it has been thought through, and I, I think perhaps I'll sort of, you know, over to... Well, I can see, I can see that... That's uh, an optimistic statement, yeah. that last one. I can, I can see, Richard, that you've thought it through and know precisely what, uh, uh, what would be most congenial in, in, in this brave new world. Uh, if I could just respond very brief, briefly to this. What I had in mind, both by human enhancement and by the sorts of changes that if we were going to create different sorts of individuals are the ones we would want to do, is anything that would make people, humans, healthier, longer lived, possibly more intelligent if we can do it, much more difficult than healthier and longer lived, and that's difficult enough. Better mental powers, better concentration, better memory, better stamina, and so on. That would be the first goal. So the first goal would obviously be, if you like, a, a health and welfare-driven goal. And the point of that, of course, is that it leaves all of the options open and personal with that longer life, that healthier life, that... Uh, increase in intelligence and memory and so forth, you can choose as you like. You can go the sensual route, if that's what turns you on. You can go the scientific route or the intellectual route or the artistic route. Those sorts of improvements are neutral between individual, the sorts of individual choices that make us all so different. And those, I imagine, will remain. But what is, it seems to me, genuinely on the agenda is the ability to improve the whole range of powers and capacities, including, of course, most importantly, health and life expectancy that we humans have. Now, if we can do that in the far future in a very radical way, it is very likely that we will cease to be human. To take just one example, uh, longevity, many people think that in principle it's possible to make humans immortal. And if Tom, um, a friend of mine, Tom Kirkwood is right, and that we don't die of old age, but of the diseases of old age, 
if we can systematically, effectively treat the diseases of old age, there is no reason in principle why we have to die. Now, that would be a hugely <coughs> radical thing to do, but it would also, of course, change us fundamentally, because one of the popular ways of, of finding an alternative description for human beings, we are mortals, to distinguish us from immortals. But if we could be effectively immortals, then we certainly wouldn't be human anymore. But many people would want that immortality if they could. And personally, I would willingly sample a few million years and see how it goes. <laughs> and of course, remembering that um, immortality is not invulnerability, I could still fall under a bus or throw myself under a bus. If, I, if it wasn't going well, after a million and a half, I have the remedy in my own hands. But you, earlier in your talk, you, you were expressing the humility of suggesting that we should, as it were, get out of the way in order to make way for a superior being. Now you're suggesting the exact opposite, which is that we should stick around for a million years um, <laughs> and thereby prevent the brave new world denizens from coming to the fore because there wouldn't be room for them. That, well, that doesn't, I mean, this is a big, a big bit. That doesn't necessarily follow. Um, we don't know what the effect of increased longevity, including e extreme longevity, would have on population. There are too many variables. But one indicator might be that in all countries where life expectancy has dramatically increased, birth rate has fallen. So it is far from clear that we would be standing in the way, even if we did live a long time, of the individuals who will eventually replace us humans. But we might stick around long enough to cheer them on. And personally, that's what I'd like to do. The, one of the um, more unpopular aspects of this kind of planning in the 20th century has been eugenic breeding of uh, superior beings um, as Hitler tried and as, uh, in a limited way, <coughs> humans have done with domestic animals for centuries. Um, is, is this John Sulston? I mean, f first, there, there, there are some people who say it's not possible with hu humans. I take it you agree it's certainly possible. Um, but is it desirable? Well, I, I think it's a mistake to mix it up too much with the Holocaust because that was uh, eugenic slaughter. Of, of grown human beings. That, of course, was, but Hitler so I think also one does tried have to, to breed. No, that's yeah. right. And Blue eyed I, Aryan, you know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So and, but I think of the two, the, the, the second is, is marginally more, more satisfactory. The trouble is, of course, you're setting out a defined programme, and that I'm very much against. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, John and I haven't really so got the programme, but I think we both share. I mean, as a, as a good anarchist, you obviously wouldn't believe necessarily, you, you know, exactly um, where, where it should all go. And I would anarchist. see... That, sorry? Intellectual <laughs> anarchist. Intellectual <laughs> anarchist. I'm sorry. As well, that's a good one. Obviously a good anarchist. one. Yes. <laughs> But, but the, the thing is, um, I, I think it's very important in my book, and obviously that's what my remarks tended to, uh, to be collectivist about this. And I think we shall perforce, otherwise, frankly, the whole thing will explode in our faces. Um, so the way I would imagine it happening, if it does, and, or when it does, perhaps, I don't know what the time scale is, um, I would see that, uh, that things would gradually change. If it were just one group against another, then, of course, in the end, nobody's going to go without a fight, which is why I predict it will be, it will be messy. But can I just expand a little on, or, or justify a little what I was saying, because you're absolutely right to introduce, for example, music. And that's why I kept on saying we must define science more broadly. And I, in many ways, I prefer the word exploration, because I think that does, in my, in my mind, uh, encapsulate very much what, what, what we're about here. And all I'm doing is to draw attention to this side of science, which is so underrated in, in, our, in our sort of accountant-driven world, the, the role of science as part of our exploration, and it's, I, I think it is extremely important. Now, exploration will include all the intellectual activities. It's just that what science does, what science discovers, the, the cosmos, for example, the, the, the nature of the probing into fundamental physics, the probing into fundamental biology, it changes our perception of everything, including, of course, the arts, music, everything. 
and, uh, and philosophy, if you like, is binding everything together. So I'm seeing this as a collective enterprise, and the important thing is not to worry too much about utility when we're, we're thinking about this great thing. But you put it more eloquently than me in the beginning. It's hard to imagine objecting to that, I think. But the thing is to rebalance it, not to put science in a pot that says, this is utility. That's where it's going wrong at the moment, and we must hold out strongly against that, or we drive ourselves down a very dangerous road. And, and we do, in fact, then we'll put, we will put things behind closed doors if we're not careful, as I said in the beginning. Yes, well, I, I think it'd be hard to object to that, but, but John Harris, you, you were suggest saying whatever turns you on, but if, which sounds fine and, and anarchistic, but it's, it's not whatever turns one on, it's whatever turns the scientist who's doing the synthesizing on, isn't it? And so there's a decision to make in, in what kind of people should there be, to quote Jonathan Glover's book. Um, it's not a decision that each one of us can make. I think I'll be a brilliant something or other. It's I think I'll make a new race of whatever it is. And that sounds awfully sinister to, to me at any rate. But uh, To me too. Yes. Uh, and, and of course, not only is that not my suggestion, it would be a futile and self-defeating thing to do. But if one improves general powers and capacities, then they can be used for anything that the individual wants them to be used for. They'll make that individual, <laughs> hopefully, a better engineer or a better scientist or maybe even a better person. Um, but they won't force that individual to be one sort of being or another or to have one, sort of, uh, one set of goals in life rather than another. I don't see these, uh, any of the these enhancing technologies which might make us healthier, longer lived, more intelligent, better stamina and so on, as directive. They're not going to force us to do anything. You may give somebody the capacity to be a great athlete, but if they want to sit at home and eat uh, chips, I am assuming that our political system will still, and indeed our moral values, will still let them sit at home and eat chips. Increasingly not, interestingly. But, uh, let's have... Let's, I'd shall, let we, the, shall we switch to, to, the, to the floor? <laughs> 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 <laughs>